And if you're going to take away anything from the sermon tonight, it's going to be remember Ephraim. Because I'm speaking to many people that have been blessed and have advantages. Ephraim had many advantages as a people. We're going to look through some of that. Ephraim, uh, verse number 15, Genesis 48. We're going to see here, this is when Israel is blessing Joseph and his children. Remember, Joseph receives the double portion. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them. And the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So he's blessing Ephraim and Manasseh. He's blessing the children of Joseph, and he's just blessing them to just become just these huge nations, these multitudes. You know, God, please bless them. And then Joseph sees that his right hand here, we'll read verse number 17. And when Joseph saw his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. So what was customary is that the firstborn child was going to receive the greater blessing because he's the firstborn. But what um, Jacob is doing here, Israel's doing, is he's actually blessing the secondborn son, not the firstborn, with the greater blessing. He's blessing both of them. So it's not like one of them's not being blessed, but he's giving the greater blessing unto the younger child. So right off the bat, that's not something that Ephraim would have expected, but something he was blessed with. It's an, it's an extra blessing for Ephraim to receive the, the top blessing here. Look at verse number 19. It says, And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. So there's one example of Ephraim just getting a great head start as far as receiving this awesome blessing. Now, one of the things that's another um, blessing for Ephraim is that Joshua, if you didn't know this, Joshua was the head of the tribe of Ephraim. That was his tribe. That's who he led. So as Joshua is leading this battle into the promised land, he's representing the tribe of Ephraim. So what better leader can you have outside of Moses, but when they're going into the promised land, Moses wasn't with them anymore. They had Joshua leading the way, setting the pace, going forward. His zeal, his dedication, his faithfulness to the word of God, just pushing the way forward. That was the tribe of Ephraim. They could, they could take, you know, a little bit of pride and say, hey, that's, he's, you know, that's our guy. That's our leader, right? Ephraim literally, and I meant to bring the map. <laughs> now, I mentioned previously, it's, you know, there's a lot of screwed up maps and things out there online, but this is such a very simple concept, and I'm not going to, uh, yeah, I'm going to try to do this, but like, I am horrible when it comes to maps. Okay, so let's just say, I know it kind of looks like Illinois or Indiana or something, but it, this, isn't, this isn't a good representation, but... When it came to their inheritance, which is what we're reading about here, Ephraim is like right in the middle. And they had tribes all around them. And you had Manasseh over here and Manasseh. And, you know, they had uh, Judah and Simeon. And they, they had, if you were going to pick a place in, the, in, in a nation to be the most secure, right? To have, to have the best advantage over all of your enemies, wouldn't you think it would just be right in the dead center? Because you've got all the rest of the tribes basically surrounding you. That was the advantage that Ephraim had. They had Joshua as a leader. They received the double blessing, which means they had a lot of people. They were blessed with being, having multitudes of people. They were not a small tribe. They had people. They had a great position within the nation. They had a great leader. 
every advantage you could possibly want. But what happens? They still don't drive out the Canaanites out of their land. Now, I don't believe it's because they couldn't drive them out. They had all the advantages. They could have. I mean, definitely, for one, if they just had the faith, they easily could have driven them out. But I'm not quite certain that it was necessarily a lack of faith that caused them not to drive out the Canaanites because we saw this before. There becomes this pattern. Once the first group, the first tribe, allows for the, for the Canaanites to dwell among them and they become tributaries or servants to them, it starts to become much more of a pattern throughout some of the other tribes where now there's multiple places where they're not expelling all of them. And I think, personally, I don't have all of the solid evidence for this uh, to just clear cut tell you this is exactly the reasoning behind it. But when you see a group of people that you can now take over and have them do your work for you, that can become enticing and give you an incentive to not want to just completely expel them because you think, hey, we're in charge now. We're very powerful. God's with us. We can handle this. We can control this group of people, you know, and they're going to serve us. And then we'll have the benefit of having these servants as well as having this land and everything else. You can see where that, that way of thinking might creep in. Now, whether or not they're guilty of this, this is still a temptation that we need to remember. And the application is, in your life, in your walk with God, you know, the Canaanites were evil. They were wicked. That's representative of sin in your life. Allowing to just hold on to some little sin, some secret sin, some pleasure that you just like to have because you think, hey, I'm spiritually really strong. I'm not going to let this ruin me. I'm not going to let this take over me. I've got control over this, but I'm going to hold on to this and, and just allow this to stay in my life. Well, what ends up happening to Ephraim? Ephraim turns out to be one of the more wicked tribes as you start reading through the Kings and the Chronicles, and especially you get into Isaiah and Jeremiah, and you see Ephraim is confederate with, with, the, with the wicked, with Syria, with the wicked people, and they're turning against their own people. And Ephraim is kind of leading the way and being really wicked. And I think it all stems back from them not being able to expel all the wicked Canaanites that God said needed to just be wiped out. And God warned them and said, look, you cannot leave these people with you. They're going to be a thorn in your flesh. They're going to draw you away from serving the Lord. You're going to end up learning their ways and they're going to inf in infect you, basically. They're like a cancer. And when you allow just extremely wicked people to remain among a righteous group of people, you know, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. The Bible warns about that regarding doctrine. But also, when you just allow extremely wicked people to be accepted and to just be inside of your land and just right in the dead center, it's going to eat you from the inside out. And when you allow some pet sin that you just don't want to get rid of because you enjoy it too much and you feel like, well, no one's ever going to know about this. This is my sin and I'm just going to hold on and keep this. It's going to lead you into all, kind, all manner of other sin. It will. Gu guarantee you, mark my words. If you're sitting there today thinking, no, I can handle this. I've got control over this. I can drink a little bit. I can do, watch a little bit of porno. I can do this. I can do that. It's not going to affect me. I guarantee you it will. I guarantee you it's going to take you way, way farther than you wanted to go. I guarantee you it's going to cause you to get into way more sin than you ever wanted to because you held on to that one and didn't just expel it out of your life. Guaranteed, that's the way sin works every single time. I do not know one person that can maintain a righteous life while still maintaining some sin consciously just holding on to that sin.